Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed. I'm Arjuna and this is the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. My guest today is Mother Irmala, also known as Dr. Edith Best. And today we're going to be talking about Vedic culture, uh, societal structure and the caste system. Uh, Dr. Best has a PhD in education. She is the chair of the Shastric Advisory Council to the GBC, an associate editor of Back to Godhead, and formerly a professor of sociology of religion at Bhaktivedanta College. She travels worldwide teaching Krishna consciousness and is the author of Essence Seekers. Dr. Best learned to read an 83 book literacy program and the great mantra for mystic meditation. So, Mother Erin Miller, thanks for coming on. So, uh, many people. Uh, I, I, I come across Christian apologists and other people who object to uh, their idea of what the Vedic culture or Varna system is based on the assumption that it has anything to do with the modern caste system and that it's a way of oppressing people based on birth. You know, the argument is that the Brahmanas, you know, who are the heads of society and they, they instruct society, they invented it so that they could benefit because the caste system is very much, you know, Brahmins at the top and everyone give their money to the Brahmins and do whatever the Brahmins tell them to. So what do you have to say to that? Uh, any system can become perverted and that's what happened. You know, people take advantage of any, of any system. So the same thing could even happen with science where we have a society where we're supposed to do whatever the scientists tell us and give all our money to the scientists and they just end up could end up abusing that hypothetically, correct? Yeah, that basically happens with any kind of system that's set up in the world. It doesn't matter. That's why in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, yada yada hi dharmasya abhuchinam adharmasya. That dharma becomes adharma and then Krishna has to come to fix it. It's just like, you know, you sweep your floor and then the next day you have to sweep your floor. And then the next day you have to sweep your floor and you wash your clothes and then you have to wash your clothes. So it, it's like that. Any kind of system that's set up, no matter how good of a system it is, tends to become perverted and polluted and people tend to exploit it. It just, it will always happen. It doesn't matter how utopian or how ideal a system is in theory somebody will find a way to exploit it. It just, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the system. It just means that it needs regular recalibration and regular cleansing and regular purifying like everything else. The idea that the Brahmins are at the top and should be given you know, money and listened to seems to be uh, an integral part of the caste system, or the, the Varna system. Would, would that be accurate? Uh, Yes and no. In, in the actual understanding of Varna, each Varna has its expertise and each Varna has its power in society. I mean, it's often compared in the scripture, the different Varnas to different parts of the body. So the Brahmanas are compared to the head, the Kshatriyas to the heart and the arms, the Vaishyas to the belly and the thighs, and the Shudras to the bottom of the legs and the feet. And your feet have a lot of power. I mean, it it would be ridiculous to say that your feet don't have a lot of power or that your arms don't have a lot of power or your stomach doesn't have a lot of power or your heart doesn't have a lot of power. I mean, you know, uh, if you've eaten a, a big meal that makes you tired, then there's nothing your brain can do. You just go to sleep and your stomach overrides your brain. It's to say that one particular part of the social body intrinsically should have more power and intrinsically should be listened to different parts of the social body should be listened to about different things. Is that kind of like how, you know, in, in a healthy marriage, it's quite, quite common that the wife will be in charge of decorating the house and, you know, she gets to decide what color the walls will be and where the pictures go and the husband just kind of defers, whereas there might be other realms where the husband gets to decide. I, I think in any kind of relationship, there's going to be some areas that are decided by mutual agreement and somewhere, you know, some parties defer to another. But we should definitely defer to people in their areas of expertise. And the idea of the Varnas is that different types of people have different types of expertise. And when you talk about giving money, I mean, the concept is much more that there should be a class of, I mean, we have this again in modern society, like people give money to students all over the world. Parents support their children going to school. The children don't have to support themselves. 
and society in general support students. There's, you know, schools run from tax dollars in as far as I know, every single country in the world. And then also when people are old and retired, they're supported by society. So again, at least the vast majority of societies have some kind of support for elderly people that comes from taxation. And then there's some concept in traditional societies that you support your elderly family members when they're old. So that's there in every society. And also in every society, there's a concept of giving monetary support to people who've dedicated themselves full time to religious work and aren't having a regular livelihood in the world. So that's, you know, Christian congregations, they support their minister. I mean, that's just normal. Uh, so the, the concept of students and retired people being supported monetarily and the concept of also certain segments of society like religious leaders being supported monetarily by others. I, I think that that's, that's not a, something that's unique to the, the Vedic scriptures, but it's a pretty much a worldwide understanding. Well, I guess when somebody has an example of someone they actually consider to be doing valuable intellectual or spiritual leadership work, then they probably wouldn't have any problems with that person receiving donations to support their activities. Yeah, I mean, also the concept of the Brahmanas is, is the there's a number of different types of occupations in the field of the Brahmanas, but one of them is intellectual research. and for intellectual research to be valuable to the society, a person can't be financially beholden to anybody. I mean, if we think about, you know, say pharmaceutical research that's funded by drug companies, the results of that research are always suspect. What you'd really like to do is have people doing pharmacological research that are financially independent. So there are certain segments of society that you want to have financial independence. You don't want them supported by government. You don't want them supported by business. And the best way to have financial independence is to be receiving random donations from a wide swath of people. You know, even if you're getting donations, if you're getting donations from, you know, one or two rich people, then that's going to skew things as well. But if you have a wide section section of society that are each giving small donations on a random basis and and random is is significant because you know if as soon as you have something that you depend on then you tend to be beholden to those people so you can have some regular monies coming in that's fine but it should be a broad enough base of financial support that people like that are free to speak truth so the, the concept of the Brahmin is being supported by society is you're talking about the truth speakers being supported by other than vested interests. That's the point of, of the idea of supporting Brahmanas. An interesting modern case is um, the, the culture of Patreon and you know people supporting like a YouTuber or something. There's a, I've heard some Christian YouTubers talking about it. They were there's a Protestant and a Catholic that you know they they were debating Protestantism versus Catholicism. And one of the things one of them pointed out in a very honest way was you know my whole YouTube channel, my whole income is from people supporting me as a Catholic apologist. So if I were to switch to Protestantism, I've got financial incentive to not do that. It's because he's got, you know, people signed up to give him regular income and there are people doing it because, you know, he's a Catholic. And if he switched, then maybe other people would start giving, but it, it would be unsettling. So, um, and, and one way it seems to be a modern example of, you know, sort of crowdfunding and, you know, it's like nobody's paying their bills except for their fans. So they're just out there being themselves and they're supported. But in another sense, it, it can also uh, hold them in a certain um, ideology. Well, that's true. And therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that every occupation, every endeavor is covered by some kind of fault. I was just thinking about this in regard to a scholar I know who published a paper on a particular theological position. And I thought, once you publish a paper on a particular position, whether it's philosophical, scientific, or theological, or whatever it is, it's very hard to publicly change your position. You know, when you put yourself out that I'm an expert in this field and this is my conclusion, 
drawn from research. Mm -hmm. You know, the, because the, uh, someone had posted in on social media and was saying, you know, can we just have an open discussion? And, and I was thinking, but they're not really looking for an open discussion because once you publish something, it's it, you've, you've committed yourself to that and you've committed your reputation to that. And I, I think this is one reason why people don't tend to change ideologies after a certain age when they have really committed and really made base their career around it. And this is why Thomas Kuhn in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions says that generally a paradigm only goes out after the people who propound that paradigm have died. So this is a different problem than money exactly. Here you're looking at a problem with what is called in Sanskrit the gunas. So the four varnas have some association with three gunas, three modes of nature. So that's uh, tamagun, rajagun, and sattvagun. And sometimes uh, it's explained, like by our great saintly persons in our own Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, other Vaishnava traditions, that the gunas are the cause of a person being in a particular varna. Like that if a person's in sattva, they'll tend to be in the Brahminical varna. And if they are in tamas, they'll tend to be in the sudra varna. And there's certainly there's validity to that. At the same time, it is said very clearly in the scriptures that you can do any varna independent of these gunas, that you can do any varna as a transcendent offering to God. So then the gunas become obstacles, they become pitfalls, and each of these four fields of work has particular pitfalls. So for those working as intellectuals, as scholars, as scientists, as religious leaders in uh, most of the fields of, of doctors, uh, those are considered the part of the Brahminical field uh, doing worship. So the thing they have to watch out for, the type of ego they have to watch out for is an ego in sattva. And this ego in sattva is I'm happier and more knowledgeable than anybody else. It's, it, that's the, the egoistic flavor of sattva. And it can push someone into a particular corner as far as their theological position, their scientific, their philosophical position, because there's a tendency for this ego of, I know more than anybody else. I'm situated, and Krishna says, they become conditioned by happiness and knowledge. So it's, that's the, the trap for those in the Brahmana Varna. And that's something that exists irrespective of money. I mean, money can exacerbate it, if everybody that's giving you money wants you to maintain your particular position, <laughs> uh, so that that's another impetus not to be flexible. But the other is just ego. I've established myself in this position as having this knowledge. And if I were to say that I'm wrong, if I were to admit any other position, then I wouldn't, you know, where would my, <laughs> where would my sense of identity go? And I've run into this myself. I, I remember publishing something and after two years of extensive research and then somebody came up with an example of where I was wrong. And it was really painful, you know, to make a, to, to say, well, can I go publicly and say that I'm wrong after I put myself out there? And that's really much more the problem. Again, finances will, it will exacerbate it, certainly, if you're financially dependent on people that, uh, that support that position, definitely. There's that quote, it's amazing what a man will fail to understand if his salary depends on it. He's not understanding it, yes. <laughs> yes, that's a fact. Uh, but I, I, that, that's true for everybody. That's true for everybody. And it's in that way, you know, anybody can be corrupted by money. But there is also a particular kind of ego that tends to corrupt intellectual scientists and, and philosophers. Is that just the nature of reality or... Is it something about the culture of, you know, what, what we value and also the sort of mentality that modern society develops in people with this kind of pride and so on? I think it's the nature of reality from the beginning of time. Because it's explained in the scriptures that sattva is a handicap 
for those who are inclined to the Brahminical field. So anyone who's inclined to the Brahminical field has to watch out for ego and sattva. And ego and sattva is especially insidious because it looks like it's not ego at all. So pretty much anyone can recognize ego in rajas. Uh, ego in tamas is a little tricky in a, in a different way. But ego in sattva is, is hard. It's, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. So it's the type of ego most conducive to transcending ego, but it also is the type of ego that's most difficult to perceive as ego. Right. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the the Vedic culture, the actual Vedic system. Um, one one way I think is a perfect modern example that everyone can understand of how the varnas shouldn't be mixed is uh, <clears throat> mixing. Well, I guess one example would be mixing money with. Uh, Brahminical activities such as, you know, medical care. And another would be um, mixing management with, you know, personal advice to somebody. So if the manager is also your mentor and that person's like, oh, I actually need somebody in this project over here doing this. And you're coming to me asking me, what's the best thing for me to do right now? This is a perfect match. I'm going to tell you to do this thing that I need for my project, as opposed to actually considering what the person actually needs. Yeah. Yes. 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 So, do you want to give a do you want to give a basic description of the four varnas and uh, wh why why it's important to break up roles in society according to those qualities and have people in those roles that have qualities suitable to those activities? Well, this is a, a very detailed discussion. I mean, I have a whole presentation on that. I don't know if you want me to to pull out. I don't even know if you can share screens or if you want me to pull out. Yeah, you can screen share. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll put a link in the description to your talk called The Yogic Path of Right Livelihood, which you gave a while back. Okay. Well, I think that's the better thing because, you know, it takes like an hour, hour and a half to really explain that. I, I think I'd rather just say then in summary that what is dharma in one of these four areas becomes a dharma in another area. So the very qualities that help you and help society in one of these four demarcations is harmful to you and harmful society when you bring it somewhere else. And this fact is the main reason why traditionally all human careers have been divided into these four categories. I mean, that was always my big question. What was the, what's the point? I mean, and sometimes, you know, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, Srila Prabhupada, will sometimes say, you know, you don't really need to demarcate yourself by one of these terms. Just whatever you're doing, do for the pleasure of the Lord. And, and that's enough. You don't need to put a label on it. So, so sometimes he would, he would say that. Uh, at the same time, generally, he would talk about that there was value to having these demarcations. And they come from Krishna himself. So what's the value? I mean, I'm not sure how many different occupations there are in the world, but my guess is it's in the hundreds of thousands. And, you know, in the modern day, we're going to group them uh, differently. Like we'd say, okay, these are engineers and, you know, these are artists. So we would have, we have names of groupings. But in the Vedic wisdom literature and the Vedic scriptures, you have these four groupings of Raman, Satya, Vaishya, Shudra. Why? Why put all ways that human beings can maintain themselves into four categories? What's the purpose? And the purpose is that work is meant to be a means of personal satisfaction, personal and familial prosperity, societal prosperity, and a way of connecting us with the divine, a way of, of a, it's supposed to be a way of spiritual connection. There's supposed to be a harmony between how we maintain our bodies, how we eat, how we have shelter, how we get food and so forth, how we contribute to society and how we connect with the divine. And this link between all of them is called Dharma. Dharma is an interesting word to try to define. I was just hearing this morning that the Dharma of sugar is to be sweet. Basically Dharma is the intrinsic quality of something, the rightness of something. And we were talking about parts of the body, and this analogy is given even like in the Rig Veda. So you could say a, a neuron in the brain, you know, a brain cell, its dharma 
is to be in the brain. When a brain cell is in the brain, the brain cell is happy. The other brain cells around it are happy. The body is happy. And the body can then fulfill its function within the society as a whole. And so if you take a brain cell and you were to put it in the heart, it would cause havoc. In fact, it would just die. Right? It, it wouldn't be able to be happy. It's all, you know, each cell is a living being. It wouldn't be happy on its own. And it wouldn't be contributing to the body or to the greater society. So the, or like a heart muscle, you know, this, a cell, a muscle cell in the heart. It's supposed to be beating, but if you put it in the stomach, it would actually be causing a disturbance. So it's exactly like that. So if we look at the different varnas and we see what is their dharma, you know, the dharma of those in the Brahminical varna is to give truth, even if it's not the kind of truth everybody wants to hear. Right? They have they have a, a, a dharma of being extremely detached. That's their dharma. As soon as someone in that field is not extremely detached, it's going to cause havoc. Right? And then let's look at the dharma of one in the shudra field. The one the dharma of one in the shudra field, they're the stability for all of society. Again, we can think of the feet. It's interesting that Lord Vishnu is associated with the legs and the feet in the Bhagavatam. So they provide all the stability in society. Without the sudra varna, society falls apart. It just falls apart. There's no plumbing. There's no, you know, garbage pickup. There's, there's, things don't work anymore. They provide all the function of society. And also they provide all the beauty of society. So you don't want your plumbing just to work. You want it to be beautiful. You don't want to see all your pipes visible, right? And you want the sewage dealt with in such a way that there's beauty in society. I mean, olfactory beauty is there too. It's not beauty. We don't just mean visual beauty. We mean beauty in terms of all of the senses. You know, picking up the, the garbage. I was um, at, at an airport. I was actually in an airport a couple of weeks ago for the first time. In the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I couldn't believe I was actually at an airport. And uh, while I was waiting for the plane, twice people came by to pick up the trash. And in each case, I said to them, thank you for making the world beautiful. And they were just so thrilled. But that's what they're doing. They're making society function and beautiful. And in that varna, they're also providing all the sensory pleasures for society. Anything that gives pleasure to our senses is coming from people in that varna. Nobody else does that. The Ksatriyas, the Vaishyas, the Brahmins, they don't do that. Only the Shudras do that. And that's also necessary, you know? Well, but the sense gratification is like salt. You have to have some. You shouldn't have too much, but you have to have some. You know, people who don't have a so-called salt-free diet, they have to eat something with salt in it. <laughs> you know, they have to eat some vegetables or something that has natural salt in it. We require that for the, the electrolyte balance in our body. And so those in the Shudra Varna are providing that. That's what they're supposed to do. But let's say someone who's psychologically suited for the Brahminical Varna goes to work, does Shudra work. So they're not going to care about sensory enjoyment. They're detached from that kind of stuff. They're not interested in it. It doesn't move them. Uh, someone, does, uh, someone who's meant for the Brahmana Varna has a very, very low requirement of sensory pleasures. And so are they gonna do their job nicely in the Sudra Varna? No, they're gonna make a mess of it. They're not gonna care if the pipes are showing or not. They're very detached. So that might be like the scientist that's happy to live in like Africa and Antarctica just because they get to study whatever it is they're studying, even though it means they've got like no uh, amenities. Yeah, and you know, you don't want that kind of person doing your plumbing. <laughs> You really don't. It's not the kind of person you want doing your plumbing. And it's not the kind of person that you want to be in the commercial arts. Now, Brahmanas can do the fine arts where they use music and painting and dance to teach philosophy. But you don't want them involved in the arts that are meant to just provide relaxation and recreation for people because they're not interested in that kind of thing. They're going to do a lousy job. 
you know, and if they do a good job, then they personally are going to become polluted. If a, if a Brahmana actually does shuja work well, and this is why Krishna says, even if you can do someone else's work well, you shouldn't, because then your work will become a vehicle of fear, he says, by Abha. So if a Brahmana does shuja work well, then they have to take on this mood of sensory enjoyment. But that's not their natural mood. You can think of it just like food. It's supposed to have some spices. It's supposed to have some flavor. That's the job of the shudras. They provide all the flavor in the society. The job of the Brahmin is just to provide vision. If you take spices and put them in your eye, it's going to be a problem. So if Brahmanas take up the sensory mood of the shudras, then they're going to be personally corrupted and they're going to mess up their jobs in society. Now, if you reverse it, you're also going to have a problem because someone naturally suited for the Shudra Varna is easily satisfied. They're not very ambitious. And someone in the Brahmin Varna is also easily satisfied. They're not very ambitious, but their source of satisfaction is different. So those in the Shudra Varna, their source of satisfaction is what we would call creature comforts. Someone in the Shudra Varna is satisfied if they can do their craft wonderfully, their real source of satisfaction is they can master their craft. They have a loving family. They have a comfortable place to live. They have nice food to eat. They're happy. Somebody suited for the Sudra Varna is not ambitious. They don't care about making a lot of money. I mean, they don't mind having a lot of money, but you know, if they win into the lottery, it's okay. But they're not going to work hard for money. It just doesn't motivate them. Well, sometimes they're like that. Like a tradesman like that, when they go self-employed, they'll like forget to invoice their customers. And even though they're working really hard, <laughs> they're not making much money. They're not, they're not concerned. But the reason they're not concerned is that as long as they have the basic creature comforts of life, they're happy. Now, a Brahmana is also not concerned, but a Brahmana is not concerned for a different reason. A Brahmana is not concerned because they have this inner source of satisfaction in the mind and in the intellect or in spirituality if they're in a different a certain type of Brahmana. That can be for anybody. But the ordinary Brahmana, their, their happiness is in the mind and intellect, not in the senses. So it's a different kind of self-satisfaction. So if you have someone who's mentally, you know, if their proclivity is for the Shudra Varna and they work in the Brahmana Varna, they're susceptible to be corrupted because they want creature comforts. And if someone provides them with creature comforts, they'll become lazy. And they won't do the research because they become corrupt. So you can see that when you mix it, it's a problem. It's a real problem. Or now let's look at the other Varnas. So the Vaishas, their interest is in quantity and in profits and expanding. The Vaishas and the Kshatriyas are very ambitious people. Their bugaboo is, is Rajagun. They have to be careful of Rajagun. And Rajagun ego is more, bigger, better you know, get my statue up in the park kind of thing. I mean, I know a, a Vaisha who uh, sold a business and said, now I can retire at 30, but I don't want to. So he bought an expensive house and an expensive car to give himself impetus to work hard, even though he could have retired. Whereas someone who's naturally in the Shudra Varna or the Brahman Varna would have just retired. And then this person not only did that, but he started his own business. And he told me, now that I have my own business, I'm making more money in three days a week than I made in five days a week when I work for someone else. I said, then you can all just work three days a week. And he said, no, I'd rather work five days a week and make more money. <laughs> so again, that kind of mentality is incomprehensible to somebody who's naturally in the Shudra Varna or the Brahmana Varna or even the Ksatriya Varna. You know, someone in the Ksatriya Varna would work three days a week and spend the rest of the time helping people in some kind of social activism. Somebody in the Brahmin of Arna would work three days a week and spend the rest of the time in study and research. Someone in the Shudra of Arna would work three days a week and spend the rest of the time with their family or their hobbies. But someone in the Vaisha Varna, they want to earn as much money as possible. They're all, and they're, they're always trying to expand and they're interested in quantity. So when you have someone who's naturally suited for the Vaisha Varna, works in the Shudra Varna, then you have mechanization of crafts then you have factories, then you have standardized parts. You have the loss of the, of the craftsmanship, craftspersonship, I suppose, 
It'll be our new year. But you, have a, <laughs> you know, a, a loss of this sense of of passing on a craft or a trade for generations and perfecting your craft or your trade or your art. Everything becomes mechanized. And we, one becomes more interested in profit than in quality. And that's what happened when someone with a Vaishya mentality goes into the realm of the Shudras. I've wondered about the value of factories and whatnot. Like if, if we didn't have factories, then there'd be a lot more local wealth because there'd be more employment, uh, more skill required, and you know, therefore higher yes. salaries for the people doing it. Uh, but overall society would be poorer. You know, it's only because of you know, big factories that you can go to Walmart and buy things that would take somebody an hour to make and you pay like $3 for it. Well, poverty and wealth, you're, you're having some a priori assumptions here about what poverty and wealth mean. You know, uh, first of all, I don't think factories would be phased out altogether because there's what factories can do that you can't do with handcrafts is having replaceable parts, standardized replaceable parts. So there are certain things that we would want to continue having standardized replaceable parts for. But you could still have factories that were done in a way that really honored tradespeople and craftspeople and really honored the needs of people in the Shudravarna instead of dehumanizing them. But prosperity, is prosperity really having a lot of mass produced clothes? There, there's a video that I saw a while ago, I, I wouldn't know if I could find the link anymore, about a places in India that received discarded clothes from rich Western countries. And they received boatloads of these discarded clothes that then, but that are still usable. And what they do is they take out all the threads and they like remake them into blankets and things like that. And it was just astonishing to these people what was thrown away. You know, having access to a large amount of, you know, mass produced clothing, I don't think has made the world richer. It's based on having uh, people work in in really subhuman conditions where they're not really taking pride in their craft or their trade. Often they don't have health benefits. Uh, if they get injured, nobody takes care of them. Uh, the clothes themselves are very cheap. The clothes may be made out of fibers that are causing pollution to the environment. People are always in anxiety about wearing, you know, is what I'm wearing the latest fashion and so forth. And then we have this huge problem of dealing with rubbish. So I don't know if that's prosperity. I'm, I'm really not sure. You know, perhaps having a smaller amount of handcrafted clothes that are genuinely beautiful and that are the result of, of centuries of tradition of clothes making might make us all a lot richer in the sense of having a truly satisfying and prosperous life. Yeah, well, that's the, the difference between quality of life and so-called financial well-being or <laughs> having lots of uh, Yeah, and that's, and and that's one of the first things whenever I talk about the Varnas, one of the very first things that I talk about is how do we define prosperity? You know, all you have to do, you can look in the, the, the news any day in any country and you will find examples of people who are <laughs> rich but do not have a prosperous life. You know, you can always find that example and you can find people who are cash for and poor and have a prosperous life. So, you know, I, I the, the concept that prosperity is only and slowly uh, mixed with the idea that cash and prosperity are equivalent is, is obviously wrong. Prosperity is something else. And, and part of prosperity is coming from doing what you're happiest doing. I mean, one of the biggest problems with the caste system is it's just based on what, what family you're born into. You know, if your parents were brahmanas and your grandparents and your great grandparents, were, then you're a brahmana. And this concept of varna by birth or caste by birth is one of the biggest degradations of the caste system. It's so obviously false. In other words, it's not that because my 
my parents are scientists that I'm necessarily going to be a scientist or that my parents are, you know, work in government. I mean, it happens. We have in, in America, we had George Bush and George W. Bush, you know, I mean, it happens that the, the father is a president and the son is also a president or the parents work in government and the children work in government, but it's not necessarily true. And, you know, you talked about in the very beginning, Brahman is exploiting the system. And one of these ways of exploitation is to say that we are in a particular type of field of work by birthright. I mean, the most ridiculous part of this birthright thing is that a lot of people don't even work in those fields. They just take the name. You know, they'll take the name Satria, but they're not actually working in government. You know, maybe they just run a little corner shop. So, that you know, they, they've separated, they, they're keeping the name, but the name doesn't mean anything anymore. They don't have the qualities, they don't have the dharma, nothing. And just because that's their family, they want to claim, oh, we're, we're better than everyone else. You know, we, we talked about... Um, exploitation uh, due, to, due to status that someone would say, my status is higher than you. But people will claim status by birth. I mean, it, that's a similar idea to racism, that I'm a higher human being than you because of the, the racial, ethnic, you know, national family I've been born into. And this is obviously rubbish. You know, it's, it's a... It's, that's the mood of the Nazis. So this concept that one's field of work is related to one's birth or one's race or, or something like that is one of the most harmful ways in which the system of Varna has become degraded. So people argue that the Vedic system is based on birth, based on uh, an analysis of Mahabharata. You know, like you have Karna and everybody's like, oh, he's of low birth. Even... Um, and they won't allow him, you know, to fight or whatnot because of that. Yeah, but that that problem of of demarcating Karna by his birth, and it wasn't even his birth, caused so many problems. You know, it caused so many problems. It wasn't it wasn't a good thing that Karna was treated like that. And it, I mean, the irony is, it, it wasn't even birth; it was an adopted family. You know, that, that was the, the ridiculous irony of it. But, uh, yeah, I think these kind of examples, these sort of his, historical examples show us that a caste system is, it's no better than Nazism or racism or anything else that oppresses some group of people based on just physiological circumstances. That's not what the Varna, the Varna system is not a caste system. It's not a hereditary system. It's a system that I think anybody would agree with, that people should, people will be happiest, <laughs> society will be happiest, everybody will be happiest if people have their work matching their natural proclivities. If people do what they love. I mean, doing what you love isn't all. That's not Varna Dharma is a lot more than doing what you love. But certainly we should do what we love and what we're good at. Why should anybody have to do things that they hate and that they're bad at? And that's in opposition to their, their nature. I mean, what kind of craziness is that? That that's like was going on under communism, especially in China, but also to some extent in Russia where you were just assigned, you talk about this mixing of the managerial role and the advisory role. You know, this needs to be done and you're warm and breathing and, you know, okay, go do it. So that's, that's absurd. Who would say that that's a good thing for society? I mean, emergencies, you know, okay. But as, as a regular thing, but that has nothing to do with a caste system, which is a kind of, again, it's, a, it's like racism. It's saying that one person is intrinsically higher or lower or intrinsically suited for a particular kind of job just because of their family and just because of their genealogy. And that's, that's it's just completely absurd. And there, there's, there's nothing in our practical experience that would support that. Again, people do tend to do things because their family did them, but it, it isn't an absolute. 
and certainly in terms of hierarchy and exploitation. I mean, there shouldn't really be any exploitation, even if people are acting according to their, their nature. So these days on the left, you're not supposed to say that some that people have innate qualities that determine what activities they're good at or bad at. You're supposed to say that anybody can do anything and they just have to, you know, figure out what their dreams are and go and pursue it. Well, that's also patently ridiculous. <laughs> if you're four foot nine, you're probably not going to be a good basketball player. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it, it's ridiculous. We obviously have different physical characteristics, you know, and we also have different mental characteristics. I mean, th this is really the old nature nurture debate that never is going to be solved completely. That to what extent is our proclivity something that we're just born with? And to what extent is our proclivity something that comes from our environment? The answer is both. And it's very difficult to tease out how much is how much. You know, any. Any parents who have more than one child, especially like my oldest son and his wife have 10 children, you can easily see that different children have different natures. I mean, even twins, they have different natures. They're different people. And even people raised in a very similar environment sometimes can be radically different. So, you know, obviously nurture isn't everything. To say that nurture is everything, it, you know, that, that's absurd. To say that nature is everything is also absurd. First of all, no matter what nature you have, it needs to be, it needs to be taken care of. You know, so I, I don't think that there's, I really don't think there's people who say that anybody can do anything. I, I, I you know, that's, that's a ridiculous argument. I, it's more the case that, I, I think on the positive side, it's a case that no matter what kind of body you have, no matter where you're born, you should have facility in society to exhibit your inherent tendencies and your inherent proclivities for your happiness and for the greater good of society. And that is the real meaning of Varna Dharma. It's part of Varna Dharma. That what, regardless of your of your gender, regardless of your of your you know, your family, regardless of your nationality, you should have the opportunity in society to be the ideal of who you are. And that's, that is part of Varna Dharma. I mean, okay, there's a few on the left, but you're going to find five people in the world who believe any crazy thing. So, you know, that's, I, I don't, I don't think we need to worry about outliers. Now, obviously, our physicality is a limit to some degree. You know, we have some innate kind of intelligence that's a limit to some degree. There's, we, we are each born with certain limits. That's just a fact. You know, that, that's just a biological fact. And within, that, within those biological limits that each of us have, and we each have different biological limits, uh, that we should have freedom in society to exhibit our what we love, what we what we're what we feel that we're meant to do, in a way that again benefits us, benefits the, the society, and is a service to the Lord. That's that is Varna Dharma. That everybody should have that that right and that opportunity, and be able to be nurtured and flourish in that way that nobody should be restricted uh, merely on the basis of some not irrelevant external. You know, that, oh, because your parents were like this, therefore you shouldn't be allowed to do this. You know, a relevant external, that's another thing. You know, that's, none of us are fully abled in all areas and in all ways. That's, that is also a biological fact. Right. Um, so other, another objection people would offer inspired by what they see going on in India today is, you know, so, okay, it's not based on birth, fine. But, you know, even if it's based on qualities, why should we discriminate? You know, why should sutras be treated so badly? Of course, um, my understanding is, as archaeology shows that, you know, back in Vedic culture, uh, the dwelling sizes were all similar, which, which indicates that the wealth di uh, distribution was fairly equal. 
So that kind of contradicts the idea that sutras are discriminated against back in Vedic culture. Well, nobody should be discriminated against. Everybody is equally valuable. But keep in mind, according to psychology, those who are suited for Vaisha and Satriya Dharma like wealth and expansion. It's important to them. And so if you say that people suited for Vaisha Dharma can't make a profit, which is part of the ideology of the communists, then they're not going to be able to function very well. And if they can't function very well, they're not going to be, they're the main people that are providing wealth for the whole society. It's those in the Vaisha, Vaisha Varna that provide all of society's wealth. And what do they get for that? Well, they get to have profit. They get to be profiteers. <laughs> that's, that's their dharma. And that's not understood by people in the other Varnas. And the other Varnas may think that that's corrupt. It's corrupt for them, but it's not corrupt for the Vaishas. They're supposed to make profit. And they can live better than other people because they're, they're making a profit. Because the other people don't care. Right. So it doesn't interest them. It's not, it's not important to them. For the Satriyas, especially the leading Satriyas, for the leading Satriyas to have some show of wealth is important for a, a healthy kind of patriotism. So pomp and ceremony have always been part of national pride. Now, national pride can be destructive in that we're better than everybody else and we're going to go beat up everybody else and, and that kind of thing. But national pride can also be very constructive that I have some national pride and therefore I take care of my fellow countrymen. This is something that my guru Shula Prabhupada talked about a lot, that you take care of the other people in your country and the animals in your country and the trees in your country. It can be a source of, you know, I have some responsibility. And one of the ways that the Satriyas have always done this is by some pomp and ceremony, by, you know, national festivals with, with some kind of grandiose celebration, and, you know, the, head of government wearing beautiful clothes and coming out in big parades. And so you feel I'm proud of my country and I want to serve my country. That's another reason is that the Kshatriyas are, uh, they're the first to run into danger. Like the firefighters who run into the fire instead of running away from the fire. And the Kshatriya Dharma is that if there is some threat to the country, the brunt of it falls on you. Everyone else goes and runs into the shelter and you go out and fight. And so it, there was some perks given to people willing to do that, that they were uh, given these perks of, of more opulence in order to compensate them. I mean, even we have some concept like that in most countries in terms of the military, that the military should get more facility by the society because they're putting their, their life and limb on the line for the, for the protection of society. So, you know, absolute equal distribution of wealth is not part of Varna Dharma. Also, the Brahmanas and the Shudras don't really care. It's not, it's not interest to them. You know, it's, they, they don't have that kind of, it's not necessary for their, for their happiness. I mean, you can give Brahmanas a lot of wealth that they could use for research and, you know, for building libraries and, and schools and, you know, extending their research lab and things like that. But that, you know, and someone in the Shudravarna, what are they going to do? I mean, it's, it's again, not their interest. After they have their creature comforts taken care of and, you know, they have some savings, then they're going to have a tendency actually to misuse it. So it's, that's not, we're not looking for, for equal, we're looking for prosperity for everyone according to their mentality and what makes each person feel prosperous. And what makes each person feel rich and what make, makes each person feel satisfied. And that's different for different people. So I think if you, you know, I mean, if, I, if I had 100 grand mansions all over the world, it would just be a burden for me. I have no interest in it. You know, I'd be like, why would I want that? And I would just try to find a way to get rid of it. So it's. You know, it, it's it's a very different. The, the idea is that there's different mentalities in the different varnas. Someone's asking for a suggestion. A scholarly book that explains karma and rebirth with good scripture references. Well, you got the Bhagavad Gita itself, of course. 
and the Bhagavatam itself, which is scripture itself, that'll do it. Sweet. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, so it's pretty clear, you know, if we actually study history that there's, you need some, you know, unequal wealth distribution, like, you know, in Ukraine when the Soviet revolution was happening and they, they found all the farmers that were the richest and they killed them. And then suddenly people were starving because they weren't just rich because they stole other people's wealth. They were rich because they were producing wealth. And when you took them away, sure. nobody was producing that wealth and people starved. Um, that's so I, I think that if you had an actual example of a society where you know we didn't necessarily have equal wealth distribution, but everybody was prosperous, I don't think anyone would look at that and think, "Oh no, this is unbearable." You know, look at those, look right. at the sutras there; they're only just getting by. Whereas you know, this guy's got five limousines. It's like, yeah, but look at those sutras yeah, that they, they've got all their medical taken care of. They never go hungry. They've got enough clothes. They've got a roof over their head. Like their needs are taken care of, and they're satisfied. Yes, and also remember that people in the Shudravarna provide all the sensory pleasure for society. So, you know, th those people, they, they, they are the ones particularly who also want not just the basic needs, but they want to have sensory pleasures in society. They provide it. It's, their, it's, it's what they're giving society and it's their food. Um, another question. Um Akshay J is saying, I get asked sometimes if Varnashram is not dependent on birth of a person, uh, why were women relegated to the background of Vedic culture? Does Varnashram apply to women too? I don't see in the scriptures that about women. I see that as a misunderstanding about women. But I, I don't see that. I see there are women Brahmanas, women Satyas, women Vaishas, and women Sutras. We talk about Krishna with his gopis. The gopis are called cowherd girls. That's what it means. And we have stories of the, the young cowherd girls. They take the milk products and they're crossing the river to sell them in, uh, in Matara. Uh, here we have a suggestion from uh, Ruchiradatta, the demystifying reincarnation by Chaitanya Taran. So that's the, the suggestion for karma and reincarnation. But anyway, I don't see that we find this in the scriptures. I don't see that women are in the background. Uh, it's just, it's not something that I see. I, I see that as a modern imposition that really stems from the Industrial Revolution, but we don't have time to talk about that now. Uh, <laughs> I, have other, I, have, I have other talks about how, how industrialization uh, adversely, and it's not that you, that you can't have a, a nice society with industry and with, and with factories and with cities, but if society is primarily industrialized, then it's very difficult to have people have this balance between work and life. And that particularly hurts women because women are the ones who get pregnant and breastfeed babies. I mean, and just because of that physiological fact, you have a, a difficulty when uh, work is all out of the home. And the way to engage in your occupation is you have to leave your home because of industrialization. So that's that's the difficulty with women. But anyway, that's a that's another another long. <laughs> but no, I, I don't see that in the scriptures. That's not what I see. R Ruchira Dasa made a nice point. I believe she's your co-author on the book you're working on on this subject. Yes, yes, we are co-authors on that book. So she's saying uh, anyone who's doing exploitation uh, is not as a, a Brahmana in name only. So address their concerns and make it clear they are not really Brahmins. So this was in response to a comment earlier, which is, "What do you say to someone uh, who?" about the fact that people are being exploited by Brahmins in India today. Yeah, then they're not, and if you're exploiting, in a in a ideal society, exploitation, I mean, I'll see how you could eliminate it entirely because we're controlled by our false ego to some extent. But exploitation society would be kept to a minimum. And there are things in society to counteract exploitation. So it's not that it's never going to come up, but there's checks and balances to keep it down and keep it under control and, and keep it, as, as I was saying in the very beginning, you know, you have to keep cleaning your room. It's just like the bathroom I use has a, a big gap at, at the bottom of the door. And it's part of a larger bathroom that also has a big gap at the bottom of the door. And it's designed so that the, there are certain lights that are on all night. So every night there are bugs that come under the door because of the light. And so every morning there's bugs in the bathroom of various types. 
And so every morning it has to be cleaned out. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're like, okay, I swept you guys up and put you guys outside yesterday. And here are your brothers and your cousins and sisters again, you know, it's, and it's like that. There has to be a continual process, a continual cleansing process of society, which is done through a complex system of checks and balances. Right. I, I, I a good example might be um, that, uh, I mean, you anywhere you'll find this principle true that um, as you can reduce something, but getting it to zero it might be impossible or near impossible. Or if you could get it to zero, the, the cost incurred would far exceed the benefit. So I, I really like how you put that. So in this world, the even trying to get difficulty, exploitation, bad elements to zero, yeah, yes, the cost incurred wouldn't be worth it. So it's it's more a, a question of kind of like walling them in. I just think of like some viruses you get on the computer, your antivirus software will eliminate it and other ones, they'll wall them off. I, I like this uh, this this thing in the chat. Varnashram seems like a natural system that any ordered society will adapt in one way, shape or form. Uh, yes, but they might not adapt the dharma of Varnashram. And so you're always going to have in any society people taking different roles, but they may not be doing that according to Dharma. If they're not doing it according to Dharma, then even though they are take, they, these natural functions will happen in society, society may not end up being truly prosperous. Right. So you've got so many modern systems like there's the big five personality traits. That I'm sure you're aware of that. It's it's not quite the same as the Varna system, obviously. Mm. Mm. Um, so I was going to give the example of of something that is you know you can reduce it, but you'll never get it to zero of of uh, police brutality. So you know recently there was this defund the police thing, and obviously that's a bad idea because the police, you know, as flawed as the system of policing is in America. It, it does reduce crime. Having it there is better than not having it there. Um, but you know you can do various things to reduce police brutality, but getting it to zero might be impossible or the cost of doing it might just create other problems. So we, we need to or live just with like in the United States, Just like the United States when they tried to prohibit alcohol entirely. Yeah, right. That didn't work, so it did it. Okay, we have a question here about untouchables. And um, is there a value in untouchables to criticize the system that plastivize us on untouchables? as opposed to Prabhupada Brahman by birth. Um, nobody should be, should be a, an outcast by birth. I mean, the only people who are really untouchables would be the serious criminals that you have to lock away. You know, if you've got really serious criminals that have to be locked up for the rest of their life. And that's not according to birth and it's not according to nationality. You know, otherwise who's untouchable? And, and, you know, the concept of somebody being untouchable because they do dirty work, that, that's not really very fair, is it? I mean, don't we want people to clean out the sewers? Aren't they doing a valuable service? Aren't they making society more beautiful? They're beauty creators. You know, yeah, I might not physically touch them when they're covered with sewage. That I might want them to take a bath and change their clothes. But once they've taken a bath and changed their clothes, then they're not untouchable anymore. And they're doing some wonderful work for the society that I'm very happy that they're doing. And it's very glorious work. And the concept of being untouchable by birth is, again, it's, it's, just, it's just another kind of racism, right? a kind of Nazism. It, it's nothing, there's nothing more than that. So this thing you get in India today where some caste Brahmins, if a sudra steps on their shadow, they'll go and take a bath or something like that. Is that total fabrication and has nothing to do with Vedic culture? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's using something good for a bad purpose. It's using, you know, a system that is meant to honor everyone and is meant to have everybody be happy and meant to create a prosperous society. It's using that simply to, to harm others. And that tendency is always there, but it has to be stopped. Um, back on the untouchables point, it, it does bring up an interesting and perhaps controversial issue that, you know, today in society, we see a lot, a lot of decadence becoming mainstream. And, you know, the left is out there, you know, 
getting young children twerking for adults and all sorts of nonsense. And you have to wonder, like, maybe there is a kind of slippery slope with some of this, you know, liberal ideas of sexuality. And there is somewhere where it's like, okay, you know, maybe some people are like that, but it's like, you go to this corner of town and you do it behind closed doors and that's not acceptable in the rest of society. So there might be a place for a kind of like, that's like, out, that's an outcast activity. And, you know, people who do that, they're kind of like fringe. We don't just accept anybody and everybody regardless of how decadent they are. Well, then you're talking again about dharma. And here you're talking more about ashram dharma rather than varna dharma. Uh, ashram dharma is what is what deals with sexuality much more than varna dharma. So in, that would kind of be another discussion about ashram dharma and what are, how do we deal with sexuality in society? And that's a, that's a huge and, and very volatile <laughs> yeah. Very volatile to topic. In fact, I found that in 2021, it's probably better not to talk about that topic too much because <laughs> such, you know. It's well, like, that's why I, I gave you the really, example you of the really children. open up a Pandora's box when you open up that one. But uh, certainly, there's there's certain kinds of sexual depravity which should not be tolerated in society at all. I mean, society shouldn't tolerate rape at all uh, in any form. It's a criminal activity. And as far as other kinds of sexuality, yeah, it should be fringe. That certain things that need to be tolerated on the fringes of society and not to become mainstream. And that's true when it comes to sexual behavior, when it comes to food behavior. You know, I, I don't think you're going to stop all meat eating in society, absolutely. You know, but if you want to eat meat, go out and go out and hunt some animal. Don't pretend it's a pet and take care of it. And don't make a whole animal feed lot and don't make a whole slaughterhouse, you know, so it, 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 there's provision for things that are outside of the of a stable society to, to happen in, in some corner because you can't, again, the cost of trying to eliminate it entirely is, is not worth it. And then there are certain things that are just plain old criminal. There's certain certain sorts of behavior that are just completely criminal. But as far as, you know, again, uh, to sexual norms is a different topic. So that's, that's again, that's, that's ashram, that's ashram dharma. That, that's not varna dharma. Varna oh, dharma is, is, is related. It's related uh, because one's livelihood is generally done uh, during the time of life that one is also most interested in sex, which is somewhere between like 15 and 60. So, you know, there's definitely a relationship that generally one's occupation is done at the same time that one is sexually or romantically inclined. And therefore occupation is almost always connected with the concept of family. So the idea is that, you know, when you're a student, we talked about earlier, when before you have your occupation, when you're a student, you're maintained by the society. And once you've retired, you're maintained by the society. But it's when you're in youthfulness that you're doing your livelihood. And youthfulness is when people generally are the most interested in, in sexuality. And one of the principles of Varna Dharma is that your wealth should be shared, that wealth should be given in charity. And at least it should be given in charity to family members. We have examples in the Bhagavatam of persons who didn't even share their wealth with their family members. So one, it's, you know, in, in a traditional society, the idea was that family and career go together, that having a a single life and having a career was, was certainly not the norm, that you didn't just earn all your money for yourself, that at least you shared your money with a spouse and hopefully with children and so forth and so on. Always but like I, I, really I really don't want to go too far afield. <laughs> you know, and then you open it up and we can talk about anything, but I certainly don't want to go far afield into it, a highly explosive topic. I always like to talk about it, that family life as, as like a kind of communism, you know, like... Yeah, it works well, you know, like the, the the problem of communism is who decides what somebody, you know, from each according to their ability to each according to the need. Yeah, who's going to decide that? But in a family or a small ashram, that's not a problem. You know, you can have like someone running the ashram or you can have the parents understand the needs of the children, understand their abilities and make those decisions without any tyranny. Works on a small Usually. scale. Usually. <laughs> Usually. Uh, we got one more question. Hey, hey. Maybe the husband, you know, wants wants a wants something, and the wife says they can't afford it, or the wife wants something, and the husband says we can't afford it. So you know that 
that that does that does also happen even in a small family. So um, Duvid's following up. Uh, and culturally, even if one rejects caste, is it still proper to pay a special form of respect to Brahmins, especially since most Hindus in the West still exclusively use Brahmins for priests? Uh, everybody, every living being should be shown respect. Every living being should be shown respect. We want to, you know, even the bugs that crawl in this lighted bathroom at night, I want to deal with them respectfully. They are still dear to God. What to speak of every human being should be shown respect. And anyone who's doing a valuable job for society should be shown respect. Again, I want somebody to keep the sewers running. I want that very much. I want someone to pick up the trash. And I want to respect the people who are picking up the trash. They're making the world beautiful. I'm indebted to them. There, there's no kind of occupation, you know, I mean, like, I'm putting aside criminality, but there's no kind of occupation that's not worthy of respect. So why in the scripture do we talk about Brahmanism? This is not Brahmanism by birth. Why do we talk about the religious teachers, the teachers of philosophy, the intellectuals as being given special respect. And let's let's think about this for a minute and then we really do have to end. Yeah. These are the people in society that are speaking truth. Their contribution to the society might be really obvious if they're working as doctors, uh, but their contribution or as teachers of children, but their contribution of society is not always that obvious. I mean, I can understand the contribution of, of, to society of someone who's growing rice or someone who's picking up the trash or someone who's making music or somebody who's, you know, running the government and make sure, making sure everybody gets clean water. But how do I gauge the contribution of somebody who's researching, you know, seemingly obscure and incomprehensible mathematical questions and publishing them in journals that are only understood by other highly qualified mathematicians. And if such people are not shown special respect, they may be, as we see in some societies that aim towards uh, total utilitarianism, the first people to be executed or imprisoned or forced into other jobs. It's very hard for people who are naturally as naturally vicious or naturally shudras to understand the work of pure research and study and teaching. And also a lot of the truths that the Brahmanists have to speak are not exactly palatable truths for people in general. I mean, you, you touched on the, you know, no illicit sex. That, that's not palatable. If we go in 2021 and say illicit sex is bad, you know, a lot of people are going to be yelling and screaming about it. And and therefore, such people need some special protection in the society. Because to many people in the society, they don't appear to be rendering a real and practical service. And they have to have the freedom to say things that are good for people, but the people might not want to hear. And therefore, such people have special protection in society. That's the concept. It's not according to birth. And without such special protection, such people, they're, they're not going to be able to survive. Those people by nature are not ambitious. They're not going to, you know, be working hard to earn a livelihood. They, they need some sort of special protection by society for the good of society. They're the eyes of the society. You know, and all of us especially, you know, we protect our eyes. Everybody understands that your eyes are one of the most vulnerable, one of the most valuable parts of your body and one of the most vulnerable parts of your body. So the, uh, someone who's actually acting as a brahmana, you know, they're also very vulnerable unless they're taken care of and given special respect. Of course, in ancient times, the brahmanas were skilled in subtle science and often had subtle powers, and that's not really true in 2021. And so I'm sure, I'm sure 
that a lot of people respected Brahman is in ancient times because of the Brahmin said, you become a frog, then you became a frog. Um, those are some nice points. Um, yeah, I think it is that is common that people will say, you know, what, what do Brahmins do for society? They don't add any value. So what you just said is a nice um, answer to that challenge. Um, I was also going to say that I think a, a real Brahmin offers respect to every living entity. So if you're offering Correct. respect to a person who is themselves offering respect to everybody else, in a sense, you're offering respect to everyone. That is such a beautiful way to end here. I, I think I think that was that's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful ending. And All someone right. asked about hermeneutics. That could also be another session. So thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I hope I had something valuable to contribute. And anything I said that was wrong, please excuse me and ignore that. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, give, leave nice comments under the video so I can convince Ermila to come on again. <laughs> Uh, let us know what you think down in the comments. If you like this kind of content, be sure to subscribe so you can see more. Uh, hit, please hit the like button to help us in the algorithm. And uh, thank you for coming on, Mother Irmala. Hare Krishna.